I'll wait for the live signal. Okay, we're live. Um, welcome, everybody. Welcome back to our course on Lenin, Leninism and the Path to Revolution with Brian Becker. Uh, we had an incredible first session last week. Uh, I hope you were all with us. If you weren't with us, you can actually watch the recording on YouTube, so I encourage you to do that. Um, and if you haven't registered for the class yet, even if you're watching us online, please go to our website and register for the class so we can send you all the readings and supplementary materials. Um, welcome, everyone. Good evening. I'm so happy to see you all. Again, my name is Leanne. Um, I'm here with Brian Becker. And we're going to get started into our second session of this class soon. I want to just make a couple of announcements. And first, just congratulate everyone on another week of incredible, uh, high-level, high-energy mobilizations for Palestine. In the face of the terrible news of the so-called humanitarian truce, which we all know wasn't really a truce, the uh, Israeli occupation continued pushing forward and assassinating and shelling, um, but they're back now on an even more intense bombardment campaign. Um, and it's been incredible to see a lot of faces in this room that I've been seeing on the streets and in our volunteer meetings and uh, also everyone online. And everyone is also committing to this by being in this class. To study the theory of revolution is only going to make our interventions in this moment stronger. So it's really incredible to see you all here. Uh, the, the video on YouTube actually circulated. It was viewed probably now over 6,000 views, I think. Uh, the first video, which is really incredible and says a lot about the moment that we're in. Um, so please do share the, the recordings with your, with your friends and comrades and let's make sure that we're all having these discussions in, in this critical time. So we do have many people on the YouTube. I want to just make a quick logistical announcement there. Uh, we have the YouTube chat open. We want it to be used really for collecting questions. Uh, either we'll be able to get to them or we will address them in future iterations of the class. We just today agreed that we will have a fourth session, a virtual session that is completely just for Q&A um, because there's a lot more questions than we're going to be able to get to in these sessions. Um, so please, if you're in the room and we didn't get to your question, make sure you send it in. If you're on the YouTube chat, make sure you're keeping the chat uh, dedicated to putting questions uh, and comments related to this class uh, so we don't distract or, or uh, make it difficult for people to follow along. Um, with that, I want to welcome Brian Becker back to the classroom and, uh, and welcome you to the room. And thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Thank you, Leanne. Uh, yeah, the great interest in the class last week, which I think is an indicator of two things. One is that we are, generally speaking, in the recent period, in a period of more intense political struggle. Uh, and as a consequence of that, people become interested in socialism and revolutionary theory and history and politics. So it actually flows from the moment that we're in the specific moment, and I'm spe speaking specifically about the uh, events in Gaza and in historic Palestine for the past two months. And then there's the broader interest that's growing still in socialism, which has been taking place in the United States for the past few years. But I, I want to just ask people here, if you could, just get a sense of the room here. I know there's a lot of people who are on YouTube. How many people here um, have participated in some demonstration related to Palestine, say, in the last seven, eight weeks? How many people? And I'll raise my hand as well. All right, so that's almost everybody. So it speaks to my point that we're, we're in a period of intense political struggle I want to also ask you uh, again, uh, how many of you have either read about or studied Lenin's works at any time in the past? Okay, so how, how many, let's to, just to get a sense of it, how many have never read anything by Lenin? Okay, a, a fairly small number. 
Um, and how many have read all 46 volumes of Lenin? <laughs> Perfect. So we have some ground to cover. One person? I've looked at You've looked at them. We have, somebody's looked at all 46 volumes. That's very impressive. Um, I want to... I want to start by going over some of the, some of the goals of this class. Uh, because, you know, we're only in session. We're, we had three uh, sessions scheduled last week, this week, and next week. Now, as Leanne mentioned, we're going to have a fourth week, which will be virtual, which will be entirely Q&A. There will be no opening talk. It'll be questions that people have from, from this class. And also for people who are on, on YouTube or in the chat or those who are in the room, uh, if you don't understand something, write it down. If you have a question about something, write it down. Uh, we can't get to everything all at once, but we do want to be able to go over everyone's questions. So you won't get an instant answer and don't feel frustrated. It's the nature of not knowing. The reason we're taking a class is that we're trying to learn things we don't know. So take notes when you stumble upon something, you're like, I don't know what that means. I don't know what this phrase means. I don't know who that person is. I don't know what time frame we're talking in. Write it down, take notes. It's like very important part of study. And to recognize that we can't have instant gratification in terms of having instant responses and knowledge about things we don't know. The whole point of study is to immerse ourselves, in, in, in this case, in a very complicated topic, recognizing that it takes lots of study, lots of reading, and lots of talking with people who are interested in the subject to have a better sense of Lenin and Lenin, what Lenin meant by the path towards revolution. We also have done some readings for the class. Um, we had three readings. They're pretty short, from left-wing communism and infantile disorder, uh, Lenin published that in 1920. Uh, that went out. How many of you in the room have had a chance to look at some or all of that, those readings? Okay, very good, good response. It shows why adult education is better than uh, <laughs> the education at school, because the education in school, everything people are reading because they have to because it's mandatory, because it's a checklist, because you're going to take, have an exam. We're not going to have any exams, uh, and we know people are studying this, involved in this, because they want to learn, not because they have to graduate from this or that course. So um, I, want to, I want to start by going over again what some of the goals are. For me, the most important goal is to help everybody read Lenin, study Lenin, and talk about Lenin more than they have before, and in order to do that, to understand the context of Lenin's writings. Again, that was my main point the way I started last week, was if you don't know what's going on in Lenin's head, you won't understand what he's writing about, because everything that Lenin wrote is essentially a polemic. He is involved in a fight. He's fighting somebody. And if you don't know who he's fighting or what the fighting is about, you'll think of Lenin's words in an abstract way. And you cannot understand Lenin in an abstraction. And I made the point that Marxists don't read Lenin the way Christians or sort of Orthodox Christianity would read the Bible, meaning the Bible is the word of God. It is the word and now our goal is to learn the word, perhaps memorize the word, and then spread the word, the good news, the gospel. Don't think of reading Marxism or Leninism in that way, because it is not the final word on anything. If you read what Lenin wrote in 1903 about the state, about his version or view of the state or the revolutionary tasks of the movement in relationship to the state, they are not the same thoughts and words that Lenin wrote in 1917, 1918. In other words, Lenin, like all of us, is growing. Lenin is evolving. Lenin is learning. Lenin is involved in debates and polemics. And some of the debates and polemics 
some of the debates and polemics he loses and he goes back and restudies the same topic and comes back and changes his basic core position or essential and important parts of the position. That's very true about the book, The State and Revolution, which is considered a classic. Lenin wrote State and Revolution at the beginning of 1917. He finishes it by the end of 1917. We republished the book. We, in the Party for Socialism and Liberation, republished the book in another book entitled Revolution Manifesto, where we talked about what we thought was the most important and continually relevant about Lenin's work on state and revolution a hundred years later. But Lenin himself actually went through a profound change on his view of what the revolutionary, uh, the revolutionary tasks of the movement were in relationship to the old capitalist state just before the revolution in 1917. And then it becomes almost a, a classic work of Lenin. Again, this means that Lenin, like all of us, is evolving. You know, you can read all 46 volumes of Lenin's collected works. Can you imagine if somebody collected every one of your letters, every one of your thoughts, every one of your articles, every one of the comments that you made and typed it all out and transcribed it and said, here's the collected works of any of us? And then later in life, you're looking back, well, now I'm 50, and then I was 20. Look what I said. And is that, are those my thoughts, my feelings? Well, they were my thoughts and my feelings then. In other words, everybody is going through an evolution. So when we read Lenin and read Marx, don't think of it as the gospel. Don't think of it as the final word. Contextualize what the debate and the argument is. So my goal, one of the goals of the class is to help people read and study and and to do it properly, which is to provide context. So what I'm doing is in this class is providing some of the context for some of the key battles that Lenin fought with the hope that you will recognize that you have to keep contextualizing all of that. Another goal for this class is to understand the revolutionary essence of Marxism. Lenin revives Marxism and transforms Marxism, which had really become, by 1910, a doctrine for reform and revitalizes the revolutionary nature of Marxism in relationship to the state, in relationship to the armed struggle, in relationship to smashing the state and creating the dictatorship of the proletariat which are terms that we're going to go over. We're going to try to un, you know, sort of talk about what some of those words mean. Another goal of the class is to understand what, Lenin, what kind of organization was Lenin trying to build and why. Again, when, when, we, when you read about Lenin or Leninism, even by those people who say that they are Leninists, they'll say that Lenin... Lenin's contribution to Marxism was that he created a party of a new type. Remember that formula, a party of a new type, meaning unlike the socialist parties that existed in the Second International. And just for context, to make it more contemporary, the Party for Socialism and Liberation, for instance, is a Leninist party and has built itself on the organizational principles, as we interpret them, of Leninism and democratic centralism. Democratic Socialists of America, DSA, is an organization that is built not on a Leninist, on a Leninist basis, but along the organizational principles of the Second International. Now, what does that exactly mean? In the Second International, the Socialists built what was called a par- the the primary leaders, they were building what was called a party of the whole class, a party of the whole proletariat, meaning that you had to represent the different strata, the different currents, the different trends, the different constituencies, that it was the party of the whole class. And Lenin accepted this thesis even after the Bolsheviks were formed. 
I want people to really try to remember this and take notes and if you try to understand what I'm saying, because this gets to the kernel of a misunderstanding of Leninism, a misunderstanding. When Lenin was forming and helping to form the Russian Social Democratic Labor Party in 1903, he was not trying to build a party of a new type. He was trying to build a party like the German Social Democratic Party, but it was a party that was being built under the conditions of czarism, of, 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 a, of a police state where working class people, and anyone for that matter, did not have free speech rights. You didn't have any civil liberties. You couldn't form a union. You couldn't form a socialist party. The question was how under the circumstances of czarist Russia, are you going to build a party like the other parties, like the German Social Democratic Party, for instance? It was only later that Lenin rejects this model altogether of the party of a whole class. And I want to, and we're going to get into why, why he rejects it. Because this is really later in Lenin's political career where the party of a new type is born. Party for Socialism and Liberation, for, by, for, by way of example, would be the party of a new type that comes later in Lenin's uh, political activity and political career. DSA, Democratic Socialists of America, still using the same organizational model, in essence, from the Second International. So, for instance, if you join the PSL, you, you go through a candidacy program, and there are 16 different candidacy classes that you go through when you're a candidate member of the party, and you learn everything about what the party stands for, what its, the, what its view on the Soviet Union is, what its view on China is, what its view on, on the national oppression of black America, on the colonial question, on the LGBTQ question, on women's oppression on how to function within trade unions, uh, a whole range of issues. And we have a very highly refined view. And after you go through this candidacy program, uh, you know, or, or you might know, do I agree with this? Is this really what I believe in or, or not? And then you decide, and the party also decides, are, do, do you agree? Do you want to be in the organization? You know that there's a a fully developed political program around which the unity of the party is constructed. And it's very refined. If it wasn't a party of a new type, if it was, let's say, DSA, you would say, I want to join the party. Here's my whatever the dues is, $15 dues. I agree in general with the principles. You're now a member of the party. So in DSA, for instance, you have people who are communists, Marxists, and people who believe in Leninism, you have people who believe in the, who are completely reject Leninism. You have a whole range of different political opinions within the same political party. And then at each moment, debates are held. Um, you know, there's a sort of an outcome, a determination. What's our position? And if, in a party like a democratic centralist party of a new type, a Leninist party, if something happens, say October 7th, October 7th, when the Hamas and resistance forces attack, uh, attack uh, the Israeli government and reconquer and take back, at least for a moment, some of the territory that was stolen from the Palestinian people, the Party for Socialism and Liberation doesn't, didn't really need to debate what to do. We already had a highly refined position. The highly refined position is that the, that the colonized people in Palestine, the people who are suffering from colonization, had the right to carry out resistance. They had the right to move instantly. Does it mean that we agree with all tactics of all, all different factions or trends within the Palestinian movement? Not necessarily, but that's not the point. We knew that in that battle we were going to stand with the Palestinian people, and we had an action-oriented plan. So by the next day, we were in Times Square. We were in the streets. 
And afterwards, the DSA, I think, uh, sponsored the demonstration. But then there was a wave of attacks against the demonstration by right-wing pro-Israeli forces and people who wanted to demonize it and caricature it and, and stereotype it. And then DSA had a great big debate. Well, should they or should they not have sponsored the, the protest? Now, that's an organizational model. I'm not, I'm not trying to say this derisively. My point is not to tell you DSA's model is bad, PSL's model is good. That's not the point. The point is it's a different model. And the model that was constructed by the parties of the Third International were premised on having a high degree of centralization and the ability to act. What is the democratic part of democratic centralism? According to Lenin, you have a party congress. The party congress makes final decisions. The congress has elected delegates. The word of the congress is the final word, at least until the next congress. The congress is the highest um, organization of the party, the highest body. It's higher than the central committee. It's higher than any individual. The party congress is the ultimate decider in a democratic centralist party. After that, in addition to agreeing to the political program, the Central Committee is also elected at the Party Congress. And the Central Committee is empowered to act so that if anything happens at any given moment, the Central Committee can give a directive to the entire organization and say, we are moving in this direction. We're going to do this. This is the plan. And everybody conforms to the plan. If people think the plan is bad, if they think the leadership is wrong, if they think the leadership has made a mistake, they can then criticize the leadership. They can even call for the recall of the leadership if the mistakes are that bad. They can demand a new election or a new Congress so that the current leadership can be replaced. So there is a lively period before every Congress of pre-Congress discussion, of debates. And then at the Congress, there's final decisions made, a central committee elected. And there's an empowered leadership, a leadership that has a centralist capacity to act and to act quickly, very quickly. If, if the police raided this place, if the police raided some office, we would have a leadership that would be in motion instantly because the point of centralism is not to make a fetish out of centralism or authority. The point of centralism is to have the ability to act quickly against an enemy that is mobilized quickly and acts quickly and acts decisively. In other words, to combat the monstrous centralism of the capitalist state, the working class needs its own centralism. If you're out on the street and the police are attacking, we have a leadership that's been empowered. If, people, if the leadership says, we're going to go forward, people go forward. If the leadership says, we're going to retreat, we retreat. We have the capacity to act decisively. We don't say, well, we don't know. We're going to have a collective discussion at the moment the police are attacking us. We have an empowered leadership. We think of all issues in the same, same sort of mode of being able to act and to act decisively. And that was ultimately the party that Lenin created. But I want to read to you how Lenin viewed the Menshevik-Bolshevik split, which I talked about a little bit last time. And again, Bolshevik means majority, Menshevik means minority. Lenin had the majority at the Congress by one vote. And two days after the Congress, he was the minority for the rest of the time. But they kept the name Bolshevik majority and Menshevik minority. So that's how the two trends knew each other. But here's what Lenin says in 1909, seven years after what is to be done is written, six years after the, uh, the split between the Mensheviks and the Bolsheviks, this is what he writes. In our party, Bolshevism, our party meaning the Russian Social Democratic Labor, Labor Party, in our party, Bolshevism is represented by the Bolshevik section. 
But a section is not a party. A party can contain a whole gamut of opinions and shades of opinion, the extremes of which may be sharply contradictory. Now, that sounds like what I'm describing for DSA, right? This is Lenin writing in 1909. In the German party, the German Social Democratic Party, which was the flagship party, they had one third of the seats in parliament. In the German party, side by side with pronouncedly rev the revolutionary wing of Kautsky, he, Kautsky is the leader of the revolutionary wing in 1909, we see the ultra revisionist wing of Bernstein. This is not the case within the section, meaning like the Bolsheviks, a section in a party is a group of like-minded persons formed for the purpose primarily of influencing the party in a definite direction for the purpose of securing acceptance for their principles in the party in the purest possible form. For this, meaning for the section, real unanimity of opinion is necessary. The different standards we set for party unity and sectional unity must be grasped and everyone who wants to know how the question of internal discord in the Bolshevik section really stands. So Lenin in 1909, seven years after what is to be done and six years after the split with the Mensheviks is saying the Bolsheviks are not their own party, we're just a section of the party. What changes in Lenin's conception is what happened in World War I. And I want to go back to this. We touched on it last time. Because again, context is everything. Right now, he's still trying to win the argument inside the party. He wants to win the Mensheviks over. He wants to win the Plakhanov, Plakhanov group over. He wants to win the Jewish Bund over. The Jewish Bund were part of the party, but they insisted that when it came to matters related to the Jewish proletariat or Jewish peasantry, that their wing of the party, their section of the party, the Jewish wing, would have complete autonomy over the direction of things related to Jewish people. And Lenin was absolutely opposed to that. He supported the right of all the oppressed nations to be self-determining, to be independent, to secede from the Russian Empire. But within the party, he insisted that all the sections, regardless of ethnicity or nationality, be equal party members, and that they all conform to the party program, the decisions of the Congress, that there not be autonomy. What changes is 1914, because in 1914, as I said last time, but I want to go into it a little bit more, World War I begins, and all of the manifestos, the resolutions from the Stuttgart Conference of the Second International, the Basel Switzerland Congress, where they had all promised each other because they could see a war was coming, uh, a war between all the capitalist powers, a war to divide the colonies. Because all the capitalists already had colonized all the world, now it was to, be, to re-divide the world. Britain and France wanted Germany's colonies in Africa and vice versa. So all the socialists could see that this was a war for colonization, a war to re-divide the world. And the people, the majority in Africa and Latin America and Asia and the Middle East, they were, just, they were just to be taken over by the capitalists in Western Europe and America. So they all said, we're going to oppose the war, and should the war come, we're going to take advantage of the war, we're going to promote the idea of revolutionary defeatism, and we're going to take advantage to overthrow our own bourgeoisie, make revolution, create social, a socialist government, and then begin... The, the union of socialist republics, meaning all the republics of the world, would join together in a union of Soviet socialist republics. Lenin's view of the USSR was not to have it be a Russian thing. He hoped Germany would be part of the USSR. He hoped Hungary would be France. He was hoping that the revolution was spreading uh, everywhere and that all these countries would become part of a union of Soviet socialist republics. And when the war broke out, the whole socialist movement changed their position. And instead of opposing the war and taking advantage of the war and making revolution, they all supported the war. Why did they support the war? Well, this was the big question. Why did a socialist party in Germany 
that had one third of the seats in the Reichstag, the parliament, the leadership, the flagship party of the Second International, why did each and every member of the parliament vote yes to the war? Well, you can, you can identify a couple elements. One is cowardice, because if you vote no to the war, you're going to end up like Eugene Debs and go to prison. Debs went to prison for 10 years at age 66 because he spoke out against U.S. entrance into World War I. In the case of the Russian parliamentary group, the Duma, those people were sentenced to, they were going, being sentenced to death for opposing voting for war. So the one-third of the members of the Reichstag, they didn't want to go to prison. They wanted to be socialist politicians who collected their socialist politician salaries and some travel allowances, and maybe an apartment. Sound familiar? People who don't want to give up the privileges that go with being in Congress or the Parliament. So cowardice is one. Okay, we can all understand cowardice. Nobody knows how, we, how strong you are or how brave you are until you're confronted with that kind of situation. I can talk to each of you and say, look, I'm... I'm a militant revolutionary Leninist. But how am I in the face of authority? That can only be, that's only can be tested how people stand up when they're being really threatened. So let's say cowardice is one level. But the fact that they all did it, only Lenin's party, which is tiny, and the Serbian Socialist Party and parts of the U.S. Socialist Party, most of the, almost all of the socialist parties capitulated. So Lenin's analysis was that it wasn't simply cowardice. Lenin's analysis, and this, I think, is a kernel, a key kernel of Leninism and how the concept of a party of a new type, the, the kind of different organization, organizational models that I was describing come into being. Lenin comes to the conclusion that the capitulation by the Socialist Party, say, in Germany, is not simply cowardice. It's also because they represent a strata in German society that is privileged. That they represent the more well-off workers, the middle-class workers, the workers who pay more attention to politics in general, the people who vote as opposed to the poor, poorest the most oppressed people who frequently in society are so busy just struggling to live that they can't fully in, engage in politics. So, let, and, and the leaders of the German party were workers. August Bebel and some of the other key leaders, they had been carpenters and you know, skilled workers who came up through the ranks. They weren't like uh, the intelligentsia or the intellectuals from middle class, they were workers who became trained communist orators and writers. But Lenin said opportunism is a consequence of in a phenomena within the imperialist capitalist countries of a sort of what he calls the labor aristocracy. The privileged sectors of the proletariat who actually identify with imperialism because they have material privilege as a consequence of the imperialists dominating and colonizing Africa, Asia, the Middle East, and Latin America. That the wealth and affluence in the West European countries or in the United States is from the excess or super profits gained by the extra profits made from the colonization, the theft, the enslavement, of people in the colonized world. And so Lenin's assessment is that this phenomena of capitulation at the beginning of World War I is, is really rooted in a, a deeper class analysis of society and a recognition that the society is not divided simply between the proletariat and the bourgeoisie, but that there are many intermediate strata in society, some of many of which are not super poor and super oppressed. They are workers, they are exploited, they are oppressed. They can be terminated, fired. Their lives can be destroyed by the capitalists. But for a given part of their life, they're doing okay. And that's Lenin's analysis. And so Lenin 
comes to the conclusion that in order for a vanguard, in order for a party to lead a revolution, which he frequently, which he says will come about mainly as a consequence of the dislocation and violence from war, that you have to have a party that can actually tr stay true to its principles of internationalism and revolution in the face of this terrible social pressure. And it's not simply the pressure of repression. If the German, com if the German Socialist Party had come out and said no to the war, we're going to vote no to the war, no to the war credits. They would not have been hounded simply by the German police, but by their fellow workers. I mean, think about what it was like in September 11th when the U.S. was attacked. You know, it's so infrequent that the U.S. is actually attacked on its own soil. You know, a lot of leftists that we knew, we said, let's start building, we built the answer coalition right away, three days after September 11th. We said, let's start mobilizing. Bush, is, Bush and Cheney are going to cynically take advantage of the rage and grief and, and suffering because the U.S. was attacked in order to carry out wars against Iraq and Libya and Syria. We have to fight now. We have to go into the streets. Most people on the left said, no, we don't, it's not appropriate. You're going to be, you're gonna, you guys are going to go to jail. Your offices are going to get raided. It's going to be a terrible sort of oppression that comes down or repression that comes down on the left. It was hard. Now, just think of the September 11th attack had been carried out where there was a second attack and a third attack and a fourth attack. It wasn't just a one-off. I mean, in the case of World War I, Germans and French soldiers were going to kill each other and did kill each other. So if you're a German and you say, well, I'm against this war, I, it's a boss's war, it's a rich man's war, we're going to stay true to our principles, a lot of the people who at the beginning of the war are going to say, well, you're a traitor. You're not just a socialist. You're, you're turning your back on your country. Our brothers and sisters and sons and husbands are being killed by these awful French imperialists. So the pressure is so great. And Lenin's argument was that in order for the party not to capitulate at a critical moment when the prospects of revolution actually open up because the war created a social crisis, creating a revolutionary opportunity, we have to have a party of a new type, a party that is completely organized and unified, and especially along principles of internationalism, of anti-imperialism, and of solidarity, and an organization that has been tested and gone through many experiences. Because if you have a right, a left, and a center like the German party did, the left is going to be overwhelmed at that moment. So that's when Lenin creates the party, envisions the party of a new type. After the Russian Revolution in 1917, when the world socialist movement looks to Russia, they, before that, Lenin's friends in the West, you could count them on the fingers of a couple of hands, not many more. He was considered like a wild man, like an extremist, a sectarian, somebody you shouldn't follow. But they, in 1917, the workers in Russia were like, we don't want to fight anymore. We are not going to fight anymore. And who did they look to? They looked to the Bolsheviks, especially because the Bolsheviks had told them from day one, this war is a rich man's war. This is a boss's war. This is not our war. We have more in common with the German and French and British workers and all of the workers than we do with our own Russian bosses. And we're willing to go to prison and even be executed to stick to our principles. Well, the Russian masses learned from that experience that they had in that Bolsheviks, a party that was serious. In other words, you can't simply lead the revolution because you lead the biggest and best and largest demonstrations in the mass movement when it's going at its zenith. How are you as a party at the moment when things are hardest, most difficult, the repression is greatest? We asked everyone to read the different stages of Bolshevism because Lenin is saying after 1917, when everybody now supporting Lenin in the Russian Revolution became a fad, in 1916, 
everybody hated Lenin. In 1917, everybody loved Lenin. Matter of fact, in, in America, in the United States, the Bolsheviks were very popular right here where we are. The Amalgamated Clothing Workers in 1919, in the middle of the White Terror and Red Terror when the Bolsheviks were basically engaged in complete armed struggle against their enemies, the Amalgamated Clothing Workers said, hell, the Bolsheviks. We're all Bolsheviks. So did the International Ladies' Garment Workers Union, the largest Yiddish-speaking newspaper, Yiddish-language newspaper, the foreword. We love Bolshevism. We're all Bolsheviks. All the most important black media, including that uh, edited by A. Philip Randolph, they were all about the Bolshevik. Marcus Garvey, who, you know, loved Lenin and paid tribute to Lenin. Everybody, the support for the Bolsheviks was very, very high after the Russian Revolution. And where the split happens inside the United States and in other places against Lenin is when Lenin says, there are experiences from our, what happened to us in these last 20 years, including how to build a party and the type of party that's needed for revolution that have universal applicability. They're not simply Russian peculiar experiences. That's why he says, read the different stages of Bolshevism. There's 1905 to 1907. There was the the revolution. Everybody's for the revolution. Then the revolution is crushed. Maybe that we have the, the, the slide. I, I promised last time I was going to use slides. The, the Stolypin neckties. There is, see these people executed? That's 1906, 1907. Stolypin is the new prime minister. The revolution's being crushed. The czar who, you know, Hollywood sort of makes movies about how wonderful Nikki and the Tsarina were. This is the handiwork of the Tsar. 15,000 people were executed like this. 15,000 in Russia. These were called the punitive expeditions. So the, the Bolsheviks are leading, helping to lead the revolution, and then they don't succeed with the armed struggle. The revolution is overtaken by counter-revolution. Everything that they had is lost. The Bolsheviks lose everything. Not everything, but they lost a lot. Then there's the period of 1907 to 1910. Lenin says, this is the period of reaction. He says, the number of people I can count on as cadre, I can count literally on the fingers of both hands. Everybody is like, it's over. Just think about when you almost have an almost revolution and you're almost there and you don't succeed, but this is what ends, this is what happens. 15,000 people hung, executed the Stolypin neckties, as they were called, were the nooses around the necks of all of the people who were executed. And so a period of reaction sets in, and then many people leave the movement. In, 19, in 1912 to 1914, there's a revival. Why? Because workers in a gold field, Lena Goldfield, are on strike, and they're massacred, just like this, the massacre that started the 1905 revolution in January 9th. So then the, the working class movement picks up, and the Bolsheviks become the biggest of the Marxist parties between 1912 and 1914. So now the Bolsheviks are riding high, Soviet, you know, workers are setting up barricades. It's almost, it looks like another revolution in 1912. And then 1914, the, rev, the, the war starts and the Bolsheviks lose everything again. So Lenin is saying in left-wing communism, in the readings we sent out, for all of you who are now part of the fad, meaning it's great to be with Lenin, it's great to be a Bolshevik, they know how to make revolution, they're audacious, they're bold, I want to be like them. I want to be that bold. Lenin says, well, don't, if, if you want to really be like us, don't think about how to make the revolution at the moment a revolution. Think about 1905. Think about 1907. Think about the lessons we learned in these different stages of Bolshevism. Because the party has to be all-rounded. Its experiences have to be able 
to show that you can go forward, but you also have to retreat. That you can be on the verge of victory and then have it all taken away from you. So Lenin's contribution to Marxism in the creation of what, what I'm going to call Leninism and the beginning of the building of a new, a party of a new type really comes about in 1914 in terms of World War I. And then in 1917, everybody is looking to become and support the Bolsheviks. And that's when the Bolsheviks and Lenin say, we need to reorganize the socialist movement so that all of the parties around the world can learn from the Russian experience, that which is universal. Not every element, of course. There are differences between Russia and Germany or Russia, Tsarist Russia and the United States. But what is universal in the revolutionary process that everybody needs to learn if your goal is revolution? And so that's when Lenin and the Bolsheviks organized the Communist International they create a new international. They require that all of the old socialist parties that want to be with the Bolsheviks, and huge, not millions, tens of millions of socialists want to be with the Bolsheviks, he said, but you have to get rid of the opportunists. We're not going to be a party of the whole class. We're not going to have a, a right wing, a center, and a left. We have to have a unity that's premised on a revolutionary program rooted in internationalism rooted in the support of the right of colonized people for self-determination, rooted in the idea that you can only make revolution by smashing the old state and erecting, creating a new state uh, based on different, a, a whole different class force. So this is the beginning, I would say, of Leninism. Bolshevism isn't Leninism until these other events take place, especially the lesson of 1914, World War I, how to combat opportunism, why opportunism exists, and why you have to organize the party on a different basis, which is then codified in the new international. And in the next class, I'm going to go in detail about what the third international was. So let's think now, let's just uh, summarize about where, who Lenin is, and again, it's all about context. It's all about context. Keep trying to discover the context. If you don't know the context, if, you're tr if you have trouble with it, call me. <laughs> uh, come to the, la the last class is going to be a Q&A. We're going to just, anything that people are troubled about, uncertain about, that's going to be nothing but Q&A. That's not next week, but the week after. But you also can do all of your own research. And look, you have to, you have to study. You have to, you have to, it's, it's hard, but you have to do it. And if you want to be a socialist, if you want to make revolution, you have to try to learn all of this. So how do we, where do we, how do we place Lenin? Let's go, I want to put up a slide. I'm going to call Lenin the fourth wave of socialism. The fourth wave of socialism, Leninism, is the fourth wave. Let's start with the first wave. Um, no. These are the utopian socialists. So we have here Robert Owens, Henri saint Simon, and Charles Foyer. Marx and Engels called these individuals utopian socialists. What made them utopian? It wasn't their political program. Lenin, I mean, Marx and Engels thought their political program was hugely significant. Robert Owens, for instance, was a Welsh uh, millionaire, manufacturer, industrialist. He gave up all of his money. Like one of those really rich people who wants to help the movement by giving their money away. You know those people? Rare, but very important. Robert Owens did that. He created in Indiana a, the, the town of New Harmony, which was a utopian commune, a city where everyone would have a job, everyone would have equal pay, women would have rights. There could be a kindergarten so that young kids could get public education. Uh, these, were, these demands were not utopian. Because we've realized them under capitalism. Many of them, not all of them, but 
kindergarten, for instance. Uh, but they were considered novel and extreme and revolutionary. Well, what Owens did is he gave all of his money. He created these communes. He said, by virtue of creating a better society within the existing capitalist society, we're going to prove that socialism is better than capitalism. And Marx and Engels called him a utopian, not because his ideas were utopian, the, the actual reforms, but he thought the bourgeoisie will not be convinced that your ideas are good ideas and thus get rid of their wealth the way you got rid of your wealth. In fact, they will fight tooth and nail. They will engage in armed struggle, as we could see with the American slaveocracy, you know, which went to war in the bloodiest of all U.S. wars because they weren't going to give up their property, meaning the enslaved people. They'd rather fight and have a million people killed than give up their property. So Marx and Engels said they're utopian because they don't believe that the class struggle is the way to socialism. They think you, in a utopian way that you could convince the bourgeoisie to be good. The bourgeoisie can't be good. Even if the bourgeoisie goes to church and thinks humble thoughts and really cares about the environment, if they're the CEO of ExxonMobil and they do all those wonderful things and donate their money and are philanthropists, if they're not going to maximize profit for ExxonMobil in the next three months, they're going to be fired because the goal of a capitalist institution is nothing other than to maximize profits. And if some group of capitalists don't do it, they'll either be undersold, gone, made bankrupt, or in the case of the CEO, replaced. So Marx and Engels believe scientific socialism means only the proletarian class struggle can bring socialism. And this is something else that differentiated Lenin, I mean Marx and Lenin, from the utopians, is the utopians looked at the working class as a victim class. They thought these poor, oppressed, exploited, illiterate workers who are stuffed into factories and work 12, 14-hour days, and so many of them children, they're, so, they're such victims. And Marx and Engels said, yes, the proletariat is a victim class, but it's also the grave diggers of the bourgeoisie. The proletariat isn't simply a victim class. It is the class that can take hold of society reorganize society, reconstruct society in the interests of society, as opposed to the interests of a corporation maximizing profit in the next three months. So Marx and Engels had this immense confidence that the proletariat, in spite of its oppression, would be the class, the only class that could reorganize society. The peasants were a bigger working class, more oppressed in many ways than the proletariat, but they were atomized, they were spread out, they weren't concentrated, they weren't in urban areas, they didn't have the strategic leverage, their ability to strike and to close the means of production, withhold their labor. That didn't exist for the peasantry. So Marx and Engels and Lenin felt that the, pro, that the peasantry would be a revolutionary class, but it couldn't be the vanguard class, that the proletariat, because of the way it was organized and the collective character of it, if you're a factory worker, you, let's say you work in a factory and you have 10,000 workers, the solution for the problems that you're facing is not to divide that factory up into 10,000 little pieces, right? Your goal is to take control as a collective of the factory, run it for the benefit of workers. But if you're a poor peasant, what you basically want is more land. The peasantry wants more private property. The oppression of the peasantry is that, the, that they are deprived of enough private property to live. So they want more. Where the proletariat has a collectivist orientation because of its social position in society, because of its relationship to the means of production as a collective workforce. But the, the, the Russian peasantry was so poor Lenin said they will be the generator of revolutionary momentum, and they were. The October Revolution in Russia is a combination of the uprising of the urban proletariat and a, the masses of peasants seizing the estates, killing the landlords, taking their land, and Lenin and the Bolsheviks said, yes, we're for you. Take the land, land to the tillers. And so the peasants thought, that's a good government. We don't, haven't read Marx, but... 
we agree with your decrees about land, which is exactly how it happened. Okay, these are the utopian socialists. First wave. Second wave. There you go. Karl Marx, Frederick Engels, scientific socialism. What was the party? Marx and Engels talked about the party. If you read their stuff, they say, the party has to do this. The party has to do this. The party should take this position. But there is no party. It's a fiction. It's kind of like they want it to be a party. But Marx is basically the organizer of the first international, the work, International Working Men's Association, which was a decidedly non-Marxist formation. It was Catholic workers, uh, Italian nationalists, British trade unionists, uh, workers of all different types. The only thing they had in common is they were all being screwed by the European bourgeoisie. And whenever workers in France went on strike, the French bourgeoisie brought in German strike breakers. And so everybody could hate the German strike breakers instead of their French bosses. And so Marx created the first international as an organization, an elementary organization of self-defense. It lasts from 1864 until 1873, but really over by 1871 with the defeat of the Paris Commune. Marx actually sent the headquarters of the Communist International to New York City because he knew it would die here. He didn't want it to continue because it was going to fall under the influence of political forces that he thought were awful. So he got it out of Europe. But the revolutionary wave after the defeat of the Paris Commune ended. Second wave, Marx and Engels promoting the idea of the urban proletariat as a vanguard class, wanting to have a party, but no party. The third wave, I don't have a picture of the third wave, so I'll fill in the third wave. The third wave was the second international. So Engels is still alive. Marx dies in 1883. The second international, the socialist international, especially located in Germany, is starting to get... The, worker, the working class in Germany gets the right to vote at the same time as anti-socialist laws are eliminated and where the, where the right to form unions is also taking place. So as soon as the workers are forming unions, they think like, wait, let's have our own political party. It's the German Social Democratic Labor, German Socialist Party. And so they start, they, because they're a majority class, they start to elect all these socialists to the Reichstag, to the parliament. So the second wave is the second international. It begins in 1888, really a couple years earlier. 1916, it ends. Why does it end? World War I ends it. You can't really seriously continue to promote the idea of workers of the world unite when each of your sections of the international is supporting the war effort designed to slaughter the workers of the other nation. So the idea of workers of the world uniting seems like a complete fiction, like a fantasy, and the second international collapses. That's the third wave. Lenin is the fourth wave. And can we have a picture of, of some picture of Lenin? Okay. Okay, there's a picture of Lenin. Right? So let's go to the picture of Lenin's brother, if we could. Okay. Just so we get how these, wa these waves of the first wave, the utopian socialist, second wave Marx and Engels scientific socialism, third wave is the second international where parties really are created, but those parties become reformist. And then Lenin returns to the road of re revolutionary Marxism by building a party of a new type based on the principles I outlined. I wanted to show before we end this picture, before we open it up for Q&A, Alexander Ulyanov, Lenin's older brother. This is a picture of him when he's about 20. Shortly after this picture, he's executed. He was uh, sent to the gallows. He was part of a small group of the Narodnik populist movement that having despaired over, despaired over the failure of Russian democratic revolution to take place, despaired over the fact that the peasantry 
which was the majority class, hadn't made the revolution, decided to take matters into their own hand and assassinate the czar. They felt if we could kill the czar, we could dispel the peasants' sort of the illusions about the czar as a great father or somebody who had a divine mandate showing that he was human and could be killed. They were so despairing. They were a vanguard. They were a vanguard who was ready to die and did die. He was 21 years old. He goes into court. Lenin is 17. His brother Alexander goes into court and says, I take responsibility for this entire plot to kill Alexander II, or Alexander III, the czar. It was my responsibility. It's actually not true. He wasn't even there at the time but he was part of the conspiracy. He and four other people are executed. He's, Lenin was very close to his brother. This young man was um, uh, a scientist. He was studying worms. He was a biologist. He was sensitive, quiet, humble, smart. He was part of the rising sort of Russian educated class that was despairing over the conditions of Russia. Feudalism, serfdom only ended in Russia in 1861. And most of the people were serfs in the countryside. And most of the peasants who were, who were either serfs or later were completely illiterate. This was Russia at that time is half, it's an empire, it's the biggest empire in the world, but it's also half colony, dominated by Western capitalism, backward because of czarism, no free speech, no civil rights, no rights at all. And so the vanguard, Alexander, ready to fight and kill and die to make the revolution, to bring Russia into the modern era. This is the end, really, of this populist movement. And Lenin, young man, 17, starts to study Marxism, starts to learn from Plekhanov, who's translated the works of Marx. And Lenin is illuminated, excited, thrilled by the idea, not of creating a vanguard. There already was a vanguard. They were the Narodniks who proudly said, we are terrorists. We're going to use terror to strike down this terrorist regime. There was already a vanguard of dedicated revolutionary fighters. But there was no revolutionary class. There was no social basis. And Lenin came to the conclusion by 1892, 1893, that in Russia, even though it was so backward, capitalism would develop, and with it would develop a proletariat, and that proletariat, as Marx said, would be the grave diggers of capitalism. And so his whole conception of building a party, first in 1903, and then later the party of a new type, is based on the idea that a vanguard can never win, that the masses make revolution, the revolution and the masses need leadership, they learned from the experience of World War I that it had to be a new kind of party, a party of a new type, in order to do that. But the mission of the Bolsheviks was always the same, to fuse the vanguard with the workers' movement, fuse the vanguard with the movement and the sufferings and strugglings of the poor peasants, and to carry out revolution. I'll finish with this quote from Lenin in 1905 at the time of the revolution. He says, Major questions in the life of nations are settled only by force. I'll say it again. Major questions in the life of nations are settled only by force. Now, in our current political atmosphere, I said last week, don't accuse me of trying to organize an armed struggle in the United States because I'm just teaching history. <laughs> because the conditions in the United States have become very repressive and people are, everyone's words are being like looked at and parsed. But let's tell the truth about history. The life, the major questions in the life of nations are settled by force. When we look at what happened on October 7th in Palestine, the whole world has changed in the last eight weeks, hasn't it? I mean, you can say whatever you want about uh, and all these imperial and pro-imperialist and semi-imperialist condemning the Palestinian military attack into into 
Israel. You can say whatever you want. It has changed everything, hasn't it? The whole world has changed. How did slavery end in Haiti? The French bourgeoisie was not going to say, oh, you know what? I read, uh, I read one of those utopian socialist books, and you're all free. No, it was a violent struggle. It was settled by force. How did, the, how did slavery in the United States end? It was the Civil War. Yes, an election triggered it, but even the election was, uh, the precursor to the election was John Brown's raid at Harper's Ferry that made the slaveocracy convinced that revolution was coming. So the South started the Civil War through a counter-revolution, but it led to the end of slavery. The only social revolution the U.S. actually ever had was right then, 1863 to 1865, and for a couple years afterwards until the counter-revolution crushed it. How did the indigenous people in, the, in North America lose all their lands? It wasn't because the pilgrims came and they read their Bible to them and they said, hey, take our land. It was force of arms. I mean, in the U.S., you, there's so much repression about what people say that you can't tell this basic truth. But that is always the decisive force. I mean, there are some instances, like in South Africa, where the armed struggle was going to win, and because of the collapse of the communist movement, the U.S. and Brit British imperialism thought they could negotiate an end to apartheid and create majority rule. And I guess from the river to the sea or the ocean to ocean in South Africa, black majority rule was negotiated in. So there are instances where there can be a negotiation. But would that have happened? Would that have happened if the Cuban volunteers had not gone to Angola and defeated the South African military in 1988 and showed that the South African fascist Regime was not invincible. So Lenin's, next week we're going to talk about Lenin's tactics because these are historically true things about the role of force. But Lenin's argument in building a party of a new type is don't simply look at the moment of revolution, at the insurrection, at the moment when there actually is violence. To build a party of a new type, you have to learn all these tactics. How are you going to be in a trade union? How, if you're elected to city council, what are you going to do? If you're elected to Congress, how are you going to be different than all other members of Congress right now and carry out the party's program? How are you going to deal with your community? If the community needs a stop sign and kids are getting run over because there's no stop sign and the city is callous, how are you going to get that stop sign? Every element of struggle, not just the armed struggle, is key to building a party that has the allegiance, the loyalty of the working class, and the training to be able to navigate through all of these troubled waters. So next time we're going to talk about the Third International, what the Leninist tactics look like, because there's a whole range of tactics. And then I want to finish next week with how the Third International, I opened with this last week, transforms communism from being essentially a European phenomena to becoming a phenomena of what was called the third world, or now is called the global south. And so the socialist movement, the socialist revolution, goes east to Asia, and it goes south to the Middle East and Africa, and of course over to Latin America as well. So that's where we're going to go, but we'll leave it right here for now. Thank you, everyone. Okay, so we're going to go to the question portion. Uh, I'm sure there's lots of questions online and here in the room. What I think we should do is take a couple questions first and then answer them together. Is that sure. okay, Brian? Yep. Um, all right, so I'm going to ask our amazing tech team, Saidi and Ryan, to send me uh, any questions from our virtual attendees in the room. If those of you who have questions can raise your hand, I'm going to prioritize people who didn't get to speak last week. Okay, raise them high. All right, so let's go here and then here, and then we'll see where we are. 
Hi. Um, last class, you were saying that it's hard to understand, it's hard to read Lenin out of context. Like, if you just pick up a Lenin book and start reading it, you might misinterpret a lot of things. Is there any books that you would recommend that talk about Lenin in that way where you can avoid that pitfall at all? One of Lenin's books? Or, or any books in general that might ha put Lenin in context. Yes, in that way. I'm going to recommend five books, by the way. I should have, I forgot. Another thing I forgot. But I have five books that I'm going to recommend. All right, where is it? And some of them are written by Lenin. Hi, Brian. Thanks so much for the amazing class. Um, I guess my question is also a little bit similar um, to the previous question in terms of like the general approach to reading Lenin or studying Lenin. Um, you talked a little bit about how uh, Lenin wasn't, his views weren't always static, they were evolving over time. Um, and specifically his views on, on democratic centralism and, and the party shifted um, throughout his, his life. So I'm wondering like what the what you would recommend as like a general approach for trying to understand Lenin and and his views on democratic centralism and and the party structure and maybe what some key texts throughout or writings uh throughout his his career one could read to um get a better understanding. Yeah. Well, maybe we should go to the books now. Is there a slide with the books? Okay, so the first book here is called Lenin. It's the Critical Life series. It's, it's just called Lenin, actually, by Lars T. Lee. It's not long. It's a short book, which um, I think <laughs> makes it very accessible. Uh, I have, like, enormous disagreements with Lars T. Lee, so I want to say that in advance, but... This book really is great if you're, in, if you're new to the subject, and also if you're not new to the subject. It's, he's, he's a good writer, and it really captures, I think, the essence of Lenin. So Lars T. Lee, um, Lenin Critical's Life Series. There's other books by Lars T. Lee, like Lenin Rediscovered. That's an 800-page or 900-page book. Um, that's not the book I'm talking about. I'm talking about this one, which is 150 pages. Second book, Red Star Over the Third World by B.J. Prashad from Tricontinental Research. We, we're going to cover more of that topic next week because we'll talk about the Communist International and its impact on the colonized world. V.J.'s book is also very accessible and shows the impact of Leninism and the communist, the victory in Russia, in, especially in the colonized and semi-colonized world. The Russian Revolution, View from the Third World by Walter Rodney. Uh, a lot of people know Walter Rodney for his book, um, How Europe Underdeveloped Africa. It, that's perhaps his most famous book. Sadly, tragically, he was assassinated at a young age. Um, Russian Revolution gives you a lot of context of what was actually of Lenin's and some of the debates and controversies going on inside the Russian movement. So I would definitely recommend Walter Rodney. Revolution Manifesto by PSL, uh, do I, that's a book we published, um, which is amazing. Um, but what we did is we republished State and Revolution, which is the easiest book, I think, to read without context. So if you want to read something by Lenin that's a little bit out, of, that doesn't require a, context it's more of a general it's Lenin's rethinking about the state and it's brilliant and you can't really be a Marxist or a Leninist without reading State and Revolution so we republished that but we have the first half of the book is our own sort of thoughts about State and Revolution a hundred years after it was published so we have four or five articles that make up half the book um, and I talk in that in that one of those sections about how Lenin did evolve starting in late 1916 uh, on, on the question of the state. Three Sources, Three Components by Marxism. Everybody should get that book. It'll take you a half an hour to read it. It's so tiny. Lenin wrote this as a, he was 
a lot of times when you're reading Lenin, you don't also know if he's writing for the censor, because if the, if the censor is involved, he's he's using language that is softer, avoids keywords like imperialism, the highest stage of capitalism. That is written for the censor. Uh, so it's not Lenin's full view on imperialism. He's writing it because he wants to get the book published. In order to get it published, it has to get through a censor. So he says, these are the economic characteristics of imperialism. So he's avoiding the revolutionary you know, tasks of the movement at that time because the censor would have silenced it. Three Sources, Three Components was written for an encyclopedia in Switzerland in 1913. Very short. It'll, it'll give you a good way to read it. Uh, State and Revolution. Okay, here's a longer, the last one, State and Revolution I already mentioned. The Russian Revolution by E.H. Carr. E.H. Carr is not a Marxist. He's a British historian. That, the Russian Revolution is three volumes, 1917 to 1923. If you are, have the time, have the interest, he's easy to read. He's a good, re, he's a good writer, excellent historian, not a Marxist, but so familiar with Bolshevik doctrine and Marxist doctrine. His whole examination of the Russian Revolution from 1917 to 23 is essentially a statement, here's Marxist and Bolshevik and Lenin's theories, and here's how they actually played out in life. To the extent that they're not really applied fully in life, it's because conditions don't allow it. Because after the Russian Revolution, Everything that Lenin did from 1917 till his death in, uh, in, in 1924, January 21st, everything is an emergency. Everything is a crisis. Everything is how are we going to survive? And they're in civil war. So you can't really look at the period between 1917 and 1923 and look at Lenin's writings and say, that's what Lenin stands for. You read it like, that's what Lenin stands for in a civil war where 14 invading armies are 100 miles from Moscow, and what do you do? So everything is emergency, 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 because they're, they're struggling to survive. Then the civil war, 3 million dead, famine, another 3 million die from hunger, all of that in the first years. So Lenin and the Bolsheviks are reacting to these immense problems and how to survive. This book by E.H. Carr, three books, it gives you a very clear sense of how the doctrine, which was so important to Lenin and to the Bolsheviks, the doctrine, the thoughts, the ideas, the principles, how they're, they're constantly being amended by the exigency or the emergency of life when they're under such survival, so, you know, struggling to survive. Great. So that, read all of these by next week. <laughs> Let us know what you think. All right, homework assigned. All right, I see more hands in the room. I'm going to take one. There's great questions coming in online. I'm going to say one of the questions online, yep. and then we can go here and here. OK, so can you speak more about the way that Russia was dominated by American or uh, European capitalism, and how was it colonialist? And then. <clears throat> All right. Uh, yes, sorry. <laughs> Hi, Brian. Um, hello. Thank you. Fantastic class. Thank you. Um, I have a question about, um, so it's actually really interesting to revisit the history of the first and second internationals. Um, and just based on the sort of um, murmurings of the crowd, it seems like some of the, the ideologies of, of those groups and those people sort of resonate with what people are hearing or talking about with um, people today. Um, and so I was wondering if you could sort of maybe go through, um, you know, why, why do we see some of those um, print, like principles or, or things of the, of the Second International show up? Why do people still cling to those like political ideas, even though they've proven to, to be on the side of imperialism, they've proven to sort of split and divide the movement to a fail in the face of, of a true revolutionary movement. Um, I guess not really, you know, what, what, how they manifest today, but really more like why, since historically, um, the, you know, the history is very clear 
Um, and then how to sort of, um, since I assume that most of us are organizers here, how do we address those, um, those failed ideas in a way that um, is accessible to people? Thank you. Uh, yeah, my question is, uh, you mentioned that both uh, Lenin's work and Marx's work should not be taken as a dogma, and uh, and also that you know should be contextualized, and also it's co constantly evolving, right? Which is uh, it's pragmatic. So my question is like, it's about revisionism, which is a word that you see thrown around a lot on uh, communist <laughs> forums. So. You know, in that context, how, how do you tell or how, you know, what makes something uh, revisionist versus uh, an evolution? And, you know, like, how, how do you go about, about throwing around that word and sort of like protecting uh, the core values uh, while allowing this evolution? Good. Okay, that's a good one. They're all good, <laughs> by the way. Um, so let me read a little bit um, some facts about Russia. This was the first question. How did foreign capital... I, I described the Russian Empire as half, half empire, half colony. Can you, sh can you show the slide of uh, one of the Russian Empire slides? Okay, you see, the, 1866. Look at how big the Russian Empire is. See, that, that's the red. Everything that's red is the Russian Empire. So you have all the way, all the way from the farthest east in, to the, uh, on the Pacific, all the way over to, to Poland. Poland was not, Poland was part of Russia. Poland was part of the Russian Empire. And of course, Alaska. Not all things are settled by force. Alaska was purchased. Um, Hawaii, not so. So look at how big that is. So you can see it's an empire, right? Okay, here are some statistics at the, at the time Lenin was uh, coming into you know, leadership. Western investors owned 90% of all Russian mines, 50% of the chemical industry, 40% of all Russian engineering plants, and 42% of the banks in Russia. So half, half empire, clearly an empire, big military force. But the bourgeoisie in Russia had been weakened and was not allowed to develop because of the reactionary pro-feudal elements of Tsarism. So the bourgeoisie didn't, cre didn't create the urban areas. It wasn't from Ru the Russian bourgeoisie, this dynamic, new, robust social class, which existed in France and Germany, for instance, or in the United States. All of, most of what contributed to the development of urban life or industrial or scientific life was imported from Western capitalists who thought they could make extra profits by investing in Russia. So those are just a clear way to show the diff half colony, half empire. Uh, second question, second and first international, the repetition of ideas that have proved to be bad ideas in the past, but they keep coming back. They will always come back because the bad, I what we consider to be the bad or not revolutionary ideas or the, the move away from internationalism and solidarity, they, Marx said the ideas of any society are the ideas of its ruling class. The ruling class molds public opinion. I mean, there's a reason, like, we turn on every television station, there's different anchors, they look different, they have different colors, and they say exactly the same thing. And so the working class and all of society keeps looking at all these same things, and people who are consider themselves very smart and form, follow foreign policy, they hear these repetitive positions over and over and over and over again, and they like, well, they start to echo them. And then, then the debate becomes, well, of course, you know, I don't support Hamas, but, so the liberals, 
the liberal sort of answer to it isn't like a profound assessment of the colonial character of the Palestinian people and why resistance is ultimately inevitable. I mean, the Palestinian people were dispossessed from their land by force. And the Israelis are taking more and more and more of it. And so to the extent that people fight back, the bourgeois media demonizes the resistance while they explain over and over again on every channel why the Israelis actually have the right of self-defense. And then all the horror stories about what happened to Israeli civilians. So in each and every instance, then if you want to go to work and say, well, look, I'm actually for the Palestinians. Their cause is just. And you get bombarded with, well, what, what about this and what about that? And all the things that people are hearing on TV, you start to, you start to bend. And you start to find what I would call the line of least resistance. And we all do that. The line of least resistance is a very functional part of living, of survival. Like you can't say everything everywhere. Uh, so the line of least resistance. But in social circles, if, if the left and socialists and communists are completely demonized, as we were since 1945, and then you finally get some social, socialists who get elected to Congress as Democrats and only with the support of the Democratic Party, and I'm not mentioning any names. <laughs> when those people want to show even sympathy for the Palestinians, they have to do that. But of course, 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 but of course. However, I think the U.S. should put pressure on Israel to carry out its operations in Gaza with a concern about civilian life. And so the tilt, the tilt is the line of least resistance. So it's very hard in a country which is the center of imperialism and where imperialist media, anti-communism, anti-revolutionary thoughts are so constantly repeated and, and considered correct and right, it's very hard to be, take a, left, a strong left position. And when we do, we have to be clever about it in the sense of not sounding like a stereotype, not sounding like we're just giving shrill rhetoric. That's why we actually have to know our stuff. We have to know facts. We have to know the arguments. We have to know how to talk to people when conditions are hard. When you go into your job, you know, some of our comrades did a, a die-in at a hospital in Albuquerque, New Mexico, the University of New Mexico, this yesterday. They got workers and doctors and medical students, and they actually did a, a die-in to protest the Gaza war in the hospital, in the hospital. Now, to, to get to the point where you have workers and students risking their careers to take that kind of dramatic action, you have to spend a lot of time with people ahead of time explaining, this is why we're going to do it, this is how we can do it. And you don't start with, necessarily in that case, from the river to the sea. Because you can't sustain that within that environment. That environment requires, you have to talk to people and use slogans that take into account what your environment is. The question, the, the challenge for revolutionaries is this is really the, I would say the, the, the biggest sort of nut to crack, so to speak. And it's kind of what we'll talk about in Leninist tactics next week. We're pursuing a revolutionary policy in a non-revolutionary country, in a non-revolutionary environment where the dominant consciousness is still profoundly backward because of the strength of the bourgeoisie's, the stranglehold the bourgeoisie has over the media. So how do we take people from where they are to the next step, to the next step, and the next step? Now, if your goal is just never to make revolution, you can take the next step and stop there. But our idea is take the next step with the idea that you're, take, you're taking the next step to take the next step that the fruit of every struggle is the expansion of the struggle. They take people beyond that. But that's a process. You know, people who are, whose entire political organizing life is online, 
they get up and they like revolutionary slogans, like showing how big and bad and militant they are. Well, if you're going to organize a job action in a hospital, that won't work. That's not the way you do it. And if you're just doing social media revolution, you can be whoever you want to be. But if you actually want to organize the masses of people, you have to take these things into account. You have to. T- why, did, why are the dominant ideas the, so bad and so repeating, second international, and again, because of the bourgeoisie? But we overcome them not by yelling and screaming revolutionary slogans, but by being very, um, you know, adept and supple. And, and by the way, we did, during the Iraq War, when the Answer Coalition, we developed a unit of, of the Answer Coalition of active duty GIs, including people who were in Iraq. People who were in the armed forces, in the Navy, in the Army, in the Marines. And we went to the bases and we were trying to recruit soldiers and sailors and Marines to become anti war. If you're going to go on the base, you have to talk way different than if you're talking on a college campus. But this is the test, this is the challenge. If you're going to be a serious movement, uh, we know why the bad ideas come about, but the question is, how do we, in a concentrated way, reach the people? A lot of people counterpose direct action versus mass organizing. Not for us. The biggest direct action, of course, is the revolution. But as Lenin pointed out, the vanguard without the class doesn't win. You can't, the people make revolution. And once the revolution's going, by the way, the revolutionaries are not as revolutionary as the people. When revolutions really start, the left wing, the people who are Marxists for decades, they turn out to be not as militant as the people who are just like at the barricades. They're like, whoa, it's like retribution. Time for, to settle the scores of decades or centuries of oppression. So at that time, the challenge for the revolutionaries is to keep it up. But now when we're in a period where we're not like that, we have to think tactically how to how to move forward. All right. What was the last one? Hmm? Oh, okay. Okay. I'm going to restate your question in case people couldn't hear you. The comrade asks this. He said, you, I'm asserting that Marxism and Leninism are not dogmas. They're not like etched in stone. You, at stone. you have to contextualize them. And then there's also in the struggle in the Marxist movement, a campaign against what's called revisionism, people revising Marx's revolutionary teachings. What's the difference? How do you know if something is bad, meaning an opportunist revision of Marx versus like just taking into account that things are changing, evolving, and obviously we have to be flexible and, and conform our, uh, what we're doing to reality. The key to the answer to this question, it's not really, it seems like a riddle, but only in the abstract. In in specificity, in specific real terms, it's not a riddle at all. Revisionism starts as a current inside the social, the second international led by Edward Bernstein. And Bernstein is a major political leader of the German party. And he's looking at everything that's happening in Germany in 1900, 1905, 1910, the socialists are getting to be one third of the members of parliament are the socialist party. They're the biggest party, bigger than the capitalist parties. And, but the workers' mood is not like revolution, but they do want to vote for socialists. And they'd like to avoid bloodshed like everyone does. And you associate revolution with bloodshed. So why not find a peaceful road? And Bernstein says, well, you know, Marx has to be revised. This is where revisionism comes from. Marx has to be revised because, one, the German proletariat's not revolutionary. It's kind of comfortable. And, or, secondly, it wants to find another road. And, you know, why can't that be a possibility? Why can't that be a possibility? Why is that revisionist as opposed to evolutionary thinking in, in the adaptation. In the case of Bernstein, it was very interesting, and it's very, I think this happens over and over again, where Bernstein showed he was not simply evolving 
Marxism to take into account a different world than the one Marx lived in was on the colonial question. Because Bernstein also argued that not only was the German proletariat not needing a revolution, but that German capitalism could be reformed if enough socialists got elected to the parliament. And if they did, they could actually bring a civilizing impact on the, German, on the people living in German colonies. So instead of making revolution against colonization, a socialist-led Germany, as opposed to an imperialist-led Germany, could be a voice of progress in the third world. I mean, isn't that sort of, these are the indicators. Racism and support for national oppression or colonial oppression are usually the tip-off for revisionism, where the struggle of the most oppressed, the struggle of the colonized, the struggle of people suffering from national oppression takes back seat where people say, well, you know, we have to preach class unity and white and black and Latino and Asian and native and Arab, we all have to get together. And that's, well, yes, I'm for that. But not if it means you're diminishing the centrality of the fight against anti-black racism in America, because that is in fact the center of capitalism was white supremacy. But you see these kind of liberal revisionist socialists will always start to say some other people's struggle takes back seat. Where in fact, the struggle, the, the black African-American freedom struggle is the detonator for all social movements in the United States, is central to the class struggle, the overall class struggle. And you can see it throughout history. I mean, the women's movement, the gay rights movement, the anti-war movement, all of that came as a consequence of the black civil rights movement, the revolution that was sweeping the country, first in the South and then in the North from 1954 to 65, 55 to 65. So that's one marker. Like, look for that. If somebody is like telling you, well, yeah, we, we want healthcare for all, that's like really important, but you don't want to talk about Palestine. If you're in the United States, in the center of imperialism that's oppressing the Palestinian people, and those people at the moment are the vanguard, are the center of the world's struggle against imperialism, which they clearly are, nothing should take primacy over that issue. Why? Not simply out of solidarity, but for the U.S. workers to build revolutionary consciousness, they have to grasp that. They have to understand this. You can't have a revolution in the belly of the beast, in the center of imperialism, and think that the colonial question or the fight against racism is somehow secondary. It is key. It is the central thing. So this is another, in my mind, another marker. But in the case of, in the case of Bernstein, he was wrong about Germany too. Because five years after he said all that, the German revolution did happen. Russian revolution happened because the, because the masses rose up and overthrew the Tsar, and then the Bolsheviks had a second revolution, and the war, Russia got out of the war. How did Germany get out of the war? Well, in the United States, on, on November 11th, we celebrate, what's it called? Veterans Day. Well, that's the anniversary of the end of World War I. How did it end? The Russian, the German working class rose up. They had a revolution. They created German Soviets, German councils. And they toppled the monarchy, the German monarchy, and that's how the World War I ended. So Bernstein was wrong about that too. The problem was the party didn't exist in Germany, the party of a new type. It was just in the beginning stages of being formed. So Karl Liebknecht, Rosa Luxemburg, the real left-wing revolutionary elements, um, they were starting, trying to form a party, it had formed a party, but they were the, still really the left wing of a larger party. And I mean, there are other reasons why the German revolution didn't succeed. I don't want to vulgarize it or oversimplify it, but not having a, a party like that made all the difference. If you look at Lenin's works, and this is when you read the 46 volumes, which I know all of you will from back to front, front to back, uh, a huge amount, most of what he's writing are internal polemics about what the party should do. In 1904, in the, during the Russo-Japanese War that ended with the 1905 revolution, 
He only wrote three articles about the Russo-Japanese War in the whole year. All of it was internal polemics about how the party should sh be shaped and formed. For Lenin, the issue of organization was primary. He always believed that a revolution was coming, like his brother did, like the others did. They knew it was going to come because Tsarism had held Russia back so much. The question is, what is the party? How will it function? What will it be? So it's not a secondary question. It is the primary question of Lenin. This is also makes Lenin different from Marx and Engels. They couldn't create a party. They wanted a party. But even the parties that came after them couldn't be those kind of parties. They were the get started parties. But Lenin, that was the great contribution of Lenin, or one of them. OK, amazing. I think we have time for maybe two more questions. OK, two more questions. So let me see hands. I know there were many. OK, I have one here. And anyone else who hasn't spoken yet in this course? Behind Eden? Hi, Brian. Hi. Thanks for this great class. I actually have two questions. Can I ask them? OK. Um, I really appreciated what you said about um, like how in World War I and generally in wars, they're not in the interests of the working class of the people. And I'm wondering if that same logic can be applied to Israel-Palestine as well, or is that like a different situation because of the settler colonial nature of Israel? And the second question I had was about um, the history of the Communist Party of CPUSA and what their position has been on major events through time and also how the PSL, like what strain they follow between democratic centralism and the other one and also how PSL relates to the CPUSA. Okay, thank you. And one final one. Um, so I just wanted to ask, I think you got into this a little bit, but I wanted to ask about kind of the challenges and opportunities of building democratic centralism and building, I guess, like working class political power in the United States. Um, I also, I guess I just wanted to reference like 2020 as being like a kind of fundamental crisis moment. Um, and I guess any lessons from that as well. Just say a little bit more about 2020 though, so I understand. Just the uprising and, and, and how uh, you would relate that to um, kind of the course of building democratic centralism, building a democratic centralist party in the oh. United States, um, or relate that to other historical events across time in the, you know, the continuum of, of the development of other political movements. Okay, yeah, that's good. All right, these are two good final questions, or three, because you had two. Um, So war in general, you know, as Marxists, communists, Leninists were against war and militarism. But Lenin makes it very clear that he's not a pacifist. So Lenin makes the distinction between wars between imperialists for the division or redivision of the colonized and semi-colonized people of the world and wars of national liberation. And he says, if there's a war of national liberation, we support the war. So how do we characterize the Palestinian struggle? Obviously, the mainstream media says Hamas is a terrorist organization, and they carried out a terrorist attack on October 7th. And so the struggle is between terrorism, Hamas, and Israel, a democracy. So in the media, the war is always characterized as the Israeli-Hamas war, Israeli-Hamas war. Like, I'm sure if you had a chance to interview the 20,000 civilians who got killed or 10,000 children and ask them, how many of you are Hamas members? I'm pretty sure very few of them are Hamas members. Uh, they weren't killed because they're Hamas. They're killed because they're Palestinians. So the, you know, the covenant on genocide internationally recognized as the destruction of a people in whole or in part. Not because of what they've done, but because of who they are. So 
This is a genocidal type war against the Palestinian people. And why? Because Hamas carried out a pretty successful military attack on Israeli territory on October 7th. Where do we stand? How do we view it? I view it exactly the same way as I view the struggle of the African National Congress in South Africa. That a colonizing party came and took the land of the people, colonized them, and the people who were colonized, who were dispossessed by violent force, have the right to reclaim their land. It's that simple. Would it be better to do it peacefully? Yes. Why? Because all humans prefer peace. But when the Palestinians in Gaza had the Great March of Return in 2018 and went to that same wall, the one that was breached on October 7th, every Friday, and they had protests and they were nonviolent, 100% nonviolent, maybe some kids threw stones, but mostly just 100% nonviolent, Israeli snipers shot them, shot thousands of them killed more than 240, including medics, press people. If a colonizing power occupies illegally somebody else's land, it does not have the right legally to claim self-defense. That right, that does not exist in either national or international law. So as the, as the Israelis commit these gen genocidal atrocities in Gaza in the name of self-defense, we, we reject it. Should the Palestinian people, should Palestine be free from the river to the sea? Yes, because all places should be free, from every place to every place. Uh, it should be free. What does freedom mean? I think freedom means an end to apartheid. A free, uh, freedom means an end to a system that has an exclusivist, white supremacist, Jewish supremacist, position against the indigenous people. Can Jews and Christians and Muslims live in the same place? Yes, they can. And how do we know? Because they did for thousands of years. It was only with the, set, the colonial settlement of this area by a majority European population that this conflict became as it is. So we make a sharp distinction. In a war of national liberation, the Leninist position is to support those who are struggling for national liberation. That's why in the case of Vietnam, when, when I was very young, I, I held up a sign that said, stop the bombing of Vietnam, stop this madness. What you're seeing in, Gen in Gaza today, we saw every day in Vietnam. The people open their media every day. Mass killing of Vietnamese. So in the beginning, people who are liberal, like myself, because most people who become socialists don't start as revolutionary socialists, they start as liberals. We transformed and we were like, no, uh, I don't, this isn't a mistake. This is an imperialist war of domination and I want Vietnam to win. So when I was drafted, which I was, at my draft physical, I, they, first you had to sign a loyalty oath, and I ripped that up, of course. And then I said, please draft me because I would prefer to go into the military because I want to organize against the war inside because it'll be more <laughs> impactful than just having street protests. And secondly, I'll never go to Vietnam to kill Vietnamese people because I want them to win. <laughs> I thought that would maybe get me out of being drafted, but it didn't. But... Um, <laughs> But that's not the way, reason I did it. But that's the thing, is we wanted the Vietnamese to win. We were, by the end of the war, by 1970, people were saying, uh, Ho, Ho, Ho Chi Minh, the NLF is going to win. We marched through Grand Central Station. We wanted them to win because it's their country. And the only reason the U.S. invaded Vietnam and killed millions of Vietnamese was they wanted to maintain colonial domination it had been a French colony, and the U.S. wanted to make sure it didn't become a socialist government. And today it's a socialist government. And today it's a thriving country. And we're always told if, if the U.S. leaves, there'll be a bloodbath. Well, the U.S. left and the bloodbath ended. And when apartheid ends, the bloodbath in Palestine will end. Yeah. 
Your second question was about the CPUSA, also a Democratic Centralist Party formally. Uh, uh, I would emphasize to the extent possible the things that we have in common between the different socialist groups. I would say the same about DSA, by the way, which I had mentioned uh, before. I don't think groups should be trying to pick fights with each other. Yes, discuss political differences. They're important. Uh, but let's not get into the squabbling. The movement is already small enough. No reason to create like a tempest in every teapot and, um, and have, I'm using idioms that are old fashioned now, uh, <laughs> unnecessary fighting that doesn't mean that much. Uh, but there are differences and there's, I would say the big difference between CPUSA and PSL is bottom line, the CPUSA, and this has been true since the seventh Congress of the Communist International in 1935, uh, the Communist Party in the US, like communist parties in much of Europe, reoriented and their main goal was not really revolution but to prevent the right wing of the bourgeoisie from taking hold of the government. And the most practical and best way according to the CP's position um, to stop right-wing Republicans from taking office is to support the Democrats. So at each and every time it's election time, the CP generally, they might not say vote for Hillary Clinton, they might just say defeat Trump. But for all intents and purposes, it's essentially the same thing. Our position is, it's not that we don't appreciate differences between, say, Obama and Trump, there are differences. They're not necessarily unimportant. But both the Republicans and Democrats are ruling class parties. Both of them are steadfastly supporting the Israeli regime for the same reason. Not because they love Jewish people, not because they're mortified by anti-Semitism, but both parties see Israel as an extension of American imperial power in a resource-rich part of the world and a loyal ally and a dependent ally on the US. And so if you're gonna be in the Democratic Party in Congress, you can't really be for Palestinian liberation because it will set you at odds with your party, the Democratic Party. So we don't believe in reforming the Democratic Party. We don't believe in getting a better Democratic Party. We wanna have a third party. If, the, if, if our candidates, Claudia de la Cruz, Karina Garcia, or other candidates, but especially those two, were in the nationally televised debates, and they could talk about, as, as Karina did in a, in a post today, about how all these kids and their moms are losing uh, WIC, uh, women and infant uh, child support. Huge nutritional program because of a $1.2 billion deficit, 60,000 families are losing this thing Meanwhile, that's nothing. I mean, the US, that's less than one B1 bomber. And Biden is saying, well, we have to send 100 billion right now for Ukraine and Israel. So if Karina and Claudia were on national TV, on the ballot in all 50 states instead of being kept out, would millions of Americans say, well, I haven't read Marx and Engels, I don't know about all that Lenin stuff, but that sounds right to me. And I prefer that to the Democrats or Republicans. The answer is yes. Yes, they would. We would get millions and tens of millions of people supporting our candidates. And that's precisely why American democracy is so undemocratic, why it won't allow these candidates. Even when Ralph Nader was on all 50 states and was polling at like 8 or 10%, and he's well-known, best consumer, most well-known consumer advocate in the country, they wouldn't let him in the debate. They threatened to arrest him when he showed up to the debates because it's their system. It's democracy for the bourgeoisie. And it's just a, it's giving the masses of people this sense of variety. You can pick who's going to oppress you for the next four years. Will it be this oppressor or that oppressor? It's your choice. So this is the, the fraudulent nature of bourgeois democracy. That said, uh, we're not gonna support the Democratic Party. Um, and a final question, and then was, it was such a good one. What was it? 2020 democratic centralism. So when the masses of people rise up like they did in 2020, I have to say that all of the, all of the left was trying to catch up because the masses of people were ahead. 
But I'll tell you what we did, and, I'll, this will, and I'm going to end with this, but this is a really excellent example of how democratic centralism works. On January 3rd, 2020, uh, we got a sense that the U.S. was about to go to war with Iran. And the next day, and we called demonstrations for January 5th. The next day, uh, General Soleimani was executed at the Baghdad airport with a drone strike. Then we built an anti-war movement. It went on for three weeks. And it was almost a near mass war with Iran. And hundreds of thousands of people in different cities had come out. Then COVID hit. And we were like, now we can't keep organizing. What are we going to do? And we created this entire online school to keep everybody organizing. Then 60 million people lost their job, and people couldn't pay their rent, and they were about to be evicted. And we started to cancel the rents uh, program, and we were doing car caravans and actions all around the country saying, you can cancel the rent. Put a moratorium on rent. And the government actually did put a moratorium on some evictions. And then, as we were planning at the end of May, May 21st, we were planning for the next big National Day of Action, George Floyd was murdered. And we told everybody, stop what we're doing with the cancel the rents. We're going to shift because we could see in Minneapolis this was leading to an uprising. We sent people to Minneapolis. We sent media teams there. We reoriented we sent out new slogans, new placards. We were able to really turn on a dime. So you, Soleimani, anti-war movement. COVID, mass unemployment. People getting evicted, there. Then a mass uprising against racism, turn again. Democratic centralism allows an organization to move quickly. And then, because you have a leadership that is, its discipline is under the program, but it's empowered to act and to act quickly. And then it's also, can be evaluated, criticized, or replaced if it makes mistakes, but it's empowered to act. So the, pro the power of democratic centralism is really for action. Uh, it's not, again, a fetish with centralism. It's like, how do you, in a complicated and big country, how do you function quickly and be able to spin quickly on a dime almost in order to respond to different needs? So. Um, I don't know if that answers your question, but it, it kind of, it's an explanation of how we function. And again, we were behind all of the parties, all of the organizations. The masses of people were ready to go. And you could see that everywhere. The barricades went up. People were tear, like I, in Washington, where I was, the first round of tear gas, people ran. Second round of tear gas, people ran. Sec, third round of tear gas, people started picking up canisters and throwing them back. Fourth round, people were like, no, let's go forward. So people were learning on their own, like instantly. And all these young people from the community were the leaders. It wasn't the left Marxist people. It was the masses of people who were like being creative and innovative and helping each other and showing solidarity. But that's how revolutions happen. That is precisely how revolutions happen. Revolutions seem to be impossible until they happen. And then afterwards, people say, oh, that was inevitable. We could see that coming because conditions were so bad. But until that, when there's apathy or not political activity, people just are, no, it'll never, nothing will ever change until it changes. So democratic centralism is basically to facilitate that change. All right, thank you. I said, I was about to say thank you, comrades. And I know we're all comrades in the most general sense. Thank you, everyone, how, wherever you are in the political line of things, but let's keep studying Lenin together and Marxism, and, and hopefully next week we'll have the finish to the class, and then the week after we'll be all Q&A, but maybe you have some announcements as well. Well, one, a big thank you to Brian for such a riveting class, so much that's applicable to this moment right now. Thank you to everyone for coming this evening to participate, everyone who's tuned in online. Again, if you didn't get to ask your question, please email it to education at peoplesforum.org. If you typed it in the chat, we've saved it. Um, we'll be back here next Tuesday. Looking forward to seeing you again at 6.30. But in the meantime, if you're in New York City, join us at Foley Square on Friday. We are taking a big mobilization for Palestine to Wall Street, to the banks of Zionism. Uh, to show them that we understand how the system works and we're not okay with it. Um, December 8th is also the anniversary of the first Intifada, so it's a very important day to be out. 
Um, and if you're in other places in the world, go to shutitdownforpalestine.org and find an action near you or organize one. Um, December 8 is the next international call to action. Um, and then, again, if you're in New York, join us on Monday evenings. We have really massive volunteer meetings uh, for the movement for Palestine right now where people from all sorts of organizations and people who are not in organizations come together and work on projects together. This week, people are going out to every neighborhood in New York City and they're doing speak outs or street teach-ins, um, getting to know the community and talking about uh, what's going on in Palestine and, and why we should be out on the streets and why we should be mobilizing. Um, so it's a good opportunity to get involved. But I just wanted to leave you with those announcements. Look in your emails for readings and other information for next class. And we hope to see you next Tuesday or sooner. Thank you, everyone.